Hello again, welcome back to one more day of daily Bible study this week. We're looking at Paul's letter to the Philippians, and we're going to finish it. We had just two weeks in this, and we're done. It's so much shorter than, than uh, you know, Acts, which took you know, the better part of you know, over half a year. Um, so starting in verse 10 and going to the end of the chapter, before we do that, let's pray. Uh, loving God, um, in this passage, we see both uh, one of the most quoted verses in the whole New Testament, uh, certainly among certain circles as well, and yet when we see it in context, we realize it means something more, bigger, more powerful than we ever thought it meant. Uh, Lord, help us to take all that to heart. Help us to rejoice in you. Help us to learn how to be content in all things. And Lord, help us to find our strength in you. Lord, we ask you to be with us during this time. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So starting in verse 10, going to the end of the chapter, we have, uh, But I rejoice in the Lord greatly, that now at last you have revived your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned before, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak from want, for I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am. I know how to get along with humble means, and I know how to get, live in prosperity. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both of having abundance and suffering need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Nevertheless, you have done well to share with me in my affliction. You yourselves also know, Philippians, that at the first preaching of the gospel after I left Macedonia, no church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving but you alone. For even in Thessalonica, you sent a gift more than once for my needs. Not that I seek a gift itself, but I seek for the profit which increases to your account. But I have received everything in full and have an abundance. I am amply supplied, and having received from Epaphroditus what you have sent, a fragrant aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. And my God will supply all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Now to our God and Father be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Greet every saint in Christ Jesus. The brethren who are with me greet you. All the saints greet you, especially those of Caesar's household. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. So once again, we have another ending of this, uh, this letter. You know, one that's much more final in a way, but we really do get like three things that Paul basically only does during conclusions. But I want to highlight this thing. So I want to tell you by way of a story, you know, another, another passage, um, that one of the things, the most common by far Bible verse you'll ever find on a card for, uh, for like high school graduates uh, is Jeremiah 29, 11, which is, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, um, you know, the plans for your, for your benefit, for your upbuilding, and not for your destruction. And um, what's interesting about that is that we often don't think about what the context of that verse is. So the fact of the matter is the whole, you know, the first 10 verses of that chapter are about, um, you know, you're going off to Babylon and it's going to be rough and you're not going to like it and you're going to yearn to come home. But you need to understand that you have got to put down some roots in Babylon because you're going to be there a while. And it says, you know, how serious, you know, like here's the thing, if you, if you thought you were going to have um, a difficult situation, but it was going to be temporary. You wouldn't buy a house. You'd rent somewhere. You know, you'd find some way to kind of, you, you wouldn't necessarily get involved in the community. You do all the different things. You're like, look, I'm just passing through. I'm not going to be here for long. Well, what Jeremiah says is, you know, buy houses, build houses, live in them, lay down vineyards. You're going to drink the produce of them. You and your children, have your children get married and have your weddings over there. Don't put off the events of life until you're back in Jerusalem because you're not going back to Jerusalem in your lifetime. You're going to die in, Jer in Babylon, basically. And, it's, and then, so then in, it's, it's in light of that context that Jeremiah 29 11 says, you know, before I know the plans I have for you, they're for your good, they're for your prosperity, they're not for your destruction. And the reason why that verse is so encouraging and so helpful is because it's being given to people who all the signs in their life are pointing to them not having positive experiences, not being uh, glad with what uh, they are being told. And so it's vitally important that we get that, 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 that sometimes the verses that we quote over and over and over again, we do it out of context. And the thing is, um, that, that verse has not become less, it's not like the context contradicts how we want to use it. It actually amplifies it so much more because you know, we're not saying, the context doesn't make front of the plans for you untrue. It makes it all the more powerful to say, even if you high school graduate, even if when you go off into college, you feel like it's an exile, even if you feel like you're a stranger in a strange land, even if it feels like you don't belong, even if it feels like it's an exile, all these different things like that, Remember that God has a plan for you. Like it actually makes it all the more powerful, but it doesn't change. But it does go against the kind of warm, fuzzy feeling we sometimes think about. In the same way, uh, one of the most pass commonly quoted passages in Philippians is Philippians four thirteen. I can do all things through Him who who strengthens me, or through Christ who strengthens me. It's a fellowship of Christian athletes. It's like their life verse. You know, you see it on Christian T-shirts. You see it on all kinds of stuff, and it usually has some sense of power and strength and physical, you know, whatever. And so this idea of I can, you know. It, the way it gets quoted a lot of times is I can run faster and lift more and work harder because of Christ who strengthens me. And it's not that it doesn't necessarily mean that, but the context is Paul saying, whatever comes my way, 
I can endure it because of Christ. He says, I can, if I have lots of resources and I can live comfortably, I can do that. But I can also do just as well without them. And that's kind of this idea. I, I know what it means to have all things. I know what it means to have nothing. I know what it means uh, to, to, um, to, to go hungry. I know what it's like to suffer and need. And he says, you gave me, you gave me gift. He says, that's what it means to, to do all things, to do all the suffering. I can do all the suffering in this world. All the, the suffering that the, that the world can inflict on me, I can do it because of Christ who strengthens me. And that doesn't necessarily undo what that verse means. In fact, it amplifies it to, a, to honestly an uncomfortable degree, just like the Jeremiah passage. Um, but it continues on here. And, and, and notice how we, this is part of the thing that might inform a Christian understanding of giving, where he says, you, you, sent, me, you sent me gifts for, to attain for my needs. And he says, I don't seek the gift. What I seek is the profit that happens to you because of the gift. I think this is incredibly important. You know, um, one of the things, so we, we had we a group from our church who went to Peru to be a mission trip, and I think it's vitally significant. I think it's important to, to be doing those kinds of things. Now, short-term mission trips have gotten a bad rap in the last couple of decades. There are people who will argue that, that it is possible to do more harm than good on a short-term mission trip, and I think there's probably ways of doing that that is the case. Now, I think that, that my understanding of how this trip was organized uh, was able to mitigate a lot of those things. I think, and I, I have a friend of mine uh, who's a John Wesley fellow along with me uh, who has done his doctoral work was on you know, how to do short-term missions well. So I think there's a lot of work being put into doing it better and better. But one of the things that's interesting is as a pastor, as excited I am for the fact that we had people go to Peru and bless the people in Peru. And I'm glad for that. You know, And I'm glad they had people who have an ongoing relationship with this community uh, so it can mitigate the dangers of doing short-term mission. As a pastor, what I'm really excited about is how that benefits the people who went. You know, the blessing that the people who went received. Yes, they went to be a blessing, and yes, I think they were a blessing, but I also rejoice in how they themselves were blessed and how those kinds of experiences changed their lives as well. You know, um, and I just, I think it's important to realize that this is what Paul's saying. He says, you know, the, someone, who, someone who gives extravagantly, whether they're their finances or their time or their energy and all the rest, someone who's giving extravagantly, yeah, it benefits the church but it benefits that person all the more. Um, you become the kind of person who can really help the kingdom, not because of what you've given, not because of the offering that you've made, but because of the kind of person that kind of offering encourages you to become. So I think it's vitally important that, that we become the kind of people who give extravagantly. Again, for, in, in any sense of that word, to give extravagantly, not because um, you know, by giving a large donation, we're gonna change the world but by becoming the kind of people who can give extravagantly for the gospel, we become the kind of people who can really make a difference. And I think that is hugely important. I think Paul gets at that, and I think that we ought to take that much more seriously in our lives. Well, that's all for today. That's all for this week. Uh, come again next week, and we'll start another book, and I have forgotten which one it is. I think it might be Second Thessalonians. Uh, in any case, have a good day.